Well, we just sang the sermon this morning, trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus, trust and obey. That's what, this, that's what the sermon's about. I want to pick up where Larry left off last week. If you weren't here, he preached a great sermon about Jesus was led out of the wilderness after facing the temptations of the devil in the power of the Spirit. That we walk in the power of the Spirit. I wish you all were available, and uh, maybe I'll just have him come up here and I'll sit down and Doug can give the sermon this morning. At the men's prayer meeting, he's saying no. At the men's prayer meeting last week, um, Doug shared about life in the Spirit and what that meant to him. And though he doesn't hear an audible voice in his ear, he does have a real sense of the leading of the Lord, of the little nudges that the Holy Spirit gives, of the little taps and pushes to go here or to go there. And we train ourselves to listen to the leading of the Spirit in our lives. And that's where our passage of Scripture picks up this morning. We're in the New Testament, John chapter 1. If you've got your Bibles, pull them out. If you don't, grab the pew Bible there in front of you if you would. John the Baptist is with his disciples. A few months ago I talked about the buggy factories in Carthage and how at the end of the 19th century, at the turn of the 20th century, that was still a going concern. And everybody needed a buggy, everybody wanted a buggy, and then times changed and the automobile came in and that time had passed. Well, John the Baptist was the last of the prophets, the first prophet in Israel for 400 years and the last of his kind. His ministry and the ministry of John the Baptist was over with. And so he had done what he was supposed to do. He was the forerunner. He prepared the way. He called on the nation of Israel to repent. Many thousands came down to the Jordan River to be baptized. And he says in, later in John's Gospel that he must decrease and that Jesus must increase and that he was okay with that because he was being led in the power of the Spirit to do the things that God had called him to do. So his ministry was winding down and he had baptized Jesus. This isn't the first time he and Jesus had met. They were cousins, so they knew each other. And um, he was there present at the baptism of Jesus and Jesus now had been led out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan and he was then led back in the power of the Spirit and when John saw him next and he'd been waiting for Jesus to reappear he pointed to him and said behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world takes away the sin of the world, not the sins. So we have this idea that we're sinners because we sin. We're sinners because we do bad acts. We're sinners because we have peccadilloes and foibles and we make mistakes and we say the wrong thing or we do the wrong thing and that's why we're sinners. But that's not why we're sinners. We're sinners because it is our nature to sin. Jeremiah says in chapter 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all else. It is desperately sick. That's the human condition. That's where we're at. That's who we are apart from Jesus Christ. And so, behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Now, John understood about lambs. This, this vignette, this passage that we're reading here, took place around the time of the Passover. And the Jews had been, through persecution, spread throughout the entire ancient world. It's called the Diaspora. And they had been spread around. And at the national holiday, the 4th of July and Christmas all rolled into one, was the Passover. The remembrance of their deliverance, their redemption, being taken out of slavery in Egypt and brought back together again as the people of God, constituting a nation of God's choosing and blessing. And so the highlight of that weekend celebration, that weekend festival, was the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb. And lambs were big business in Israel at that time. The temple was a growing, going concern and people who came from the hinterlands to come to Jerusalem to worship didn't come with their lamb under their arm to Jerusalem. They came to Jerusalem and when they got there then they purchased a lamb. So the temple raised flocks and flocks and thousands of sheep and then they drove them to the temple for the sacrifices that would be taking place on that weekend. 
So when John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the... He probably hears the bleating of sheep in his ears. He may see the flocks on the hillsides. And who is this Jesus? John is the son of the priest Zechariah. John knows well, as the author of Hebrews says, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. In the book of Exodus, God gave this command to the priests, and he's the son of a priest. Uh, this is Exodus chapter 29, verse 38. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs a year old, day by day, regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And with the first lamb, a tenth of a measure of fine flour, etc., etc. But these sacrifices were a regular daily occurrence, morning and evening in the temple, for the sin of Israel, for the sins of the people. And so John says, Behold the Lamb of God. Now the action in John's gospel hasn't really started moving yet. Now it's beginning to get going. The first part of John 1 is John's prologue. It's a theological dissertation about the, the eternal divine sonship of the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Don't even name him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Don't, doesn't even give his name yet. Um, but now John is identifying him, and he's pointing to his disciples on the next day. So John's been waiting for Jesus to reemerge from the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. Both Jesus in the power of the Spirit, but John. His ministry was now over with. And it was time for him to turn his disciples over to Jesus. And he says on the second day, and the next day it says in the Scriptures, John says again, Behold the Lamb of God. And he had two, at least two, of his disciples with him. And they heard him say, I'm done. He's the big deal in Israel now. My ministry is over with. Follow him. And so Andrew and an unnamed disciple, probably Philip, stop following John and start following Jesus. When we start to follow Jesus, we stop following things that we have been following. They stopped following John the Baptist. We, hopefully, stop following the crowd. We stop following culture. We stop following the expectations that other people put on top of us, and we follow Jesus. And so that's what we see in our passage this morning. We see these two disciples. Now, John is mature, and we need as parents and Christians to be as mature as he is. See, we want our children to remain dependent on us. We want to hang on to our children, and we want to continue to control our children and make decisions for our children. But when John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, he lets them go. It's as if he was waiting for Jesus to come and to present his disciples to Jesus. They're not mine anymore. They're yours. And we do the same thing with our children. It's not good for them or healthy or appropriate for them to be dependent on us forever. At a certain point, we commit them back to the Lord. Paul says, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ. You didn't begin the good work in the lives of your children. You're not going to bring that good work to completion. They are their own individual selves, and they have been called by God in life for whatever it is that God has set before them to do. And like John the Baptist, we need to decrease, and we need to allow Jesus to increase, and we need to step back. That's true of our earthly, physical children, our biological children, but it's also true of our spiritual children. It's true of our own disciples. John the Baptist let go of his disciples, and he allowed them to become disciples of Jesus. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus walking by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following. Now this is a divine appointment. John had been waiting with his disciples for Jesus to reemerge. Now Jesus has reemerged. And now John is turning his disciples over to Jesus, and Jesus turns around and there's two guys following me. No one comes to Jesus unless the Father sends them. If you've got your Bibles, uh, turn to chapter 6. 
I'm not going to find it now. I think it's verse 26. Nope, I'm not going to lay my fingers on it. Jesus says in John chapter 6 that, um, oh, here it is, 65. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. No one can come to Jesus unless it was granted to him by the Father. Again, we're talking this morning about the power of the Spirit, that John in the power of the Spirit released his disciples. Now his disciples begin to follow Jesus. It had been granted to them by the Father that they might become disciples of Jesus, not John the Baptist. And now back to chapter 1. So Jesus turned to them and said, what are you seeking or what do you want? And they're not sure what they're seeking or what they want. They were followers of John the Baptist. So typically, what do people seek? What do people want from Jesus? They want to see him put on a show. Do your miracles for us, Jesus. That's what they said back at his synagogue in, in uh, Nazareth. We heard about all the great things you did not come here and do your magic tricks for us. Where they want to change circumstances. Get me out of debt. Get me a new wife. Get me a new husband. Get me a new job. Get me a new place to live. Get me this. Get me that. Get me, get me, get me, get me. Be my Santa Claus, Jesus. What do you want, he turns and he asks them. And what they want is him. What they want is to know him. They want to know who he is and why he is here and why he, how possibly he could be a bigger deal than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the first prophet in Israel for 400 years. God hadn't spoken since Malachi. And now John the Baptist is saying, I've got a decrease in this guy. Follow him. He's going to be the big deal. Follow him. Well, they want to know, well, what makes you the big deal? What is it about you? And so... They ask him a question. He says, what are you seeking? Now, they say, where are you staying? They're not asking for his street address. They're not asking for his Twitter address. They're not asking for his email address. They're asking him, who are you? And what is your mission? Why are you here? Why should we follow you, in other words? And Jesus issues a wonderful invitation, one that we should steal from him. When I was on staff with Young Life, we always said, if somebody's got a good idea and you don't steal it, it's a sin. <laughs> Jesus said, come and see. And we want to give that same invitation to other people. Jesus said to these two disciples of John the Baptist, you want to know where I'm staying? All right, come on, guys, come and see. And they went and they spent the day with him. In another translation, it says they remained with him. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus unless you remain with him. People come to Jesus because they want a piece of him, or they want him to give them something, and they want him to be Santa Claus. But we need to seek him for his own sake. We need to come to him, and we need to remain with him, to be with him. And so they stayed until the ninth or tenth hour, and it was four o'clock in the afternoon. They spent the day with Jesus. Jesus said, come and seek. Bring your questions. Ask me whatever it is that you want to know. Let me tell you about who I am and why I'm here. And, and the Father has brought these two to me. Jesus and the power of the Spirit discerned out of all the people that are hanging around, here's these two guys following. These are going to be two of my disciples in the power of the Spirit. And so he discerned that the Father had sent these two to him. So he gave them an invitation, come and see. And then I love this. So I don't know how long you've been a Christian. Andrew spent the day with Jesus. He's been a Christian for a few hours. And he goes off and he does evangelism. Huh? I don't know. Did Jesus do an evangelism explosion seminar? Now, when you go see your brother again, ask him, if, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? Why should a holy God let you into his heaven? I don't think Jesus was doing a seminar in evangelism. I think that Andrew was so taken with Jesus. Andrew was so excited about this person that he's just met, this ministry that was described to him, the promise that this guy is the Messiah of Israel, the one they've all been looking for and waiting for, that he cannot contain himself. All of us have circles of influence. All of us have people in our lives, people that we work with, people that we play with golf with, people that are in our families, people that don't know Jesus. Are we excited? 
about Jesus the same way Andrew is excited about Jesus. He gets released by Jesus. They've been together with him, sequestered, asking questions, being taught. And as soon as he gets released, he's like a shot out of a cannon for his brother, his brother Peter. Now, Peter is a fisherman. And Peter, I'm sure, probably resented Andrew. Andrew is a religious nut. He follows the color of the day. What's the big religious thing? I'm the follower of this one and the follower of that one. Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. And now he's coming to Peter. No, I'm not his disciple anymore. I got a new thing. I got a new thing. It's not a fad. It's not a, 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 a thing that we're going to go through. He's found the Messiah. And Peter, Peter's been carrying the load. Peter's not only having to support his family, he's got to support Andrew's family because Andrew isn't working, he's hanging around with prophets. And so Peter probably worked all night fishing and here comes Andrew to wake him up. Oh, get up, get up, get up, we met the Messiah. Or he's down by the, the Sea of Galilee and he's mending his nets and here comes Andrew to tell him all about Jesus or he's got his fish in the marketplace. He's been up all night and worked all day and now he's trying to sell his fish in the marketplace and while he's haggling prices, here comes Andrew. Oh, I gotta talk to you, I gotta talk to you. I'd hit him in the head. But he doesn't. It says the next line, what does it say? And he brought him to Jesus. That's evangelism. He didn't do anything heroic, he didn't do anything crazy. He simply brought him to Jesus. Now, Peter, he's been bearing the load. He's been carrying the weight for the family. How did Andrew get Peter to come to Jesus? I can't go and horse around like you've been doing. I am responsible. I've got to pay the bills. I've got a job. I've got to get up in the morning and go to work. People have all kinds of excuses about why they can't come to Jesus, but somehow Andrew gets him there. When I was in high school, I had a very radical conversion. I was a miserable teenager, teenage alcoholic. I was partying uh, every weekend. I was drinking at school and getting suspended for that. And I came to faith in Jesus Christ, and he changed my life. And I wanted to share Jesus with people that I cared about. One of my best friend's name was Adolfo Luis Jose Alvarez Hegovich de Estado de Munoz. <laughs> Say it with me. <laughs> Adolfo, foe. If you watch that 70s show, he's Fez. He's from Mexico. He's a foreign student, he's, but he's a good friend of mine. And he didn't want anything to do with Jesus because he was my carousing partner. He was my drinking buddy. And he didn't appreciate that my life had changed and he didn't want what I had. Now, his mom liked me. So I got two of my friends and we went to Foe's house and I got these two guys that are bigger than me to grab him by each arm and throw him in the back of my mom's station wagon. And I told his mom, I'm taking him to Young Life and I'll bring him back in two hours. And she said, go ahead. And so off we went. And he brought him to Jesus. I heard about Jesus in Young Life. I heard the gospel presented in a way that was appropriate for a teenager in Young Life. And I wanted that for my friends. I wanted foe to hear about Jesus. I wanted foe to meet Jesus. That's what Andrew is doing here with his brother. Somehow he gets him in front of Jesus. And it says, and Jesus looked at him. And Jesus sees things that we don't see. Jesus doesn't see what he could become. Jesus looks at Peter and sees who he would become. He would become the leader of the band of the 12 disciples. He would become the leader of the three in the inner circle. He would be the one who on the day of Pentecost would stand up and who would preach and 3,000 people would place their faith and their trust in Jesus. Now, we look at Andrew. And Andrew just has a servant's heart. Andrew has a heart for individual people, individual souls. If you look in the New Testament, he's mentioned nine times, apart from the lists of the 12 disciples, nine times. Most of the time, even here before we've met Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother, he's playing second fiddle to his brother already, right out of the gate. And he's playing second fiddle to his brother now. Peter 
gets to be in the inner circle. Peter gets to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration and see Jesus in all of his glory as the, the second person of the Trinity, the Divine Son. Peter gets that experience, Andrew doesn't. Peter gets to go into Jairus' daughter's bedroom and watch Jesus raise this dead little girl to new life, to life. Peter gets that experience, Andrew doesn't. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd be resentful. I brought him to you. Why don't I get to go up the mount? Why don't I get to go see you raise the dead? We don't get any of that. And it's not like the scriptures are reticent about people's foibles, about people's faults, about the dumb things that they do. And we know all about Peter. He says the wrong thing. He does the wrong thing. He steps in it all the time. He cuts off Malchus's uh, ear. He, I mean, he's always doing the wrong. He's impetuous. He's erratic. He's loud. He's everything that Andrew isn't. In the pages of the New Testament, when he's by himself or when he's asked a question, Andrew always says the right thing. Andrew always does the right thing. How come Peter gets all, get, gets in the inner circle, but he's left to the side? You know, each of us has a different personality. Each of us have different spiritual gifts. God has made each of us unique in our own way. And he uses us in our uniqueness we're not all called to stand up in front on a Sunday morning and talk to the entire church. Most of us are called individually to talk to one or two other people and to bring them to Jesus. That's what we see in Andrew in the pages of the scriptures. Next time we meet Andrew, Jesus is feeding 5,000. Feed him. McDonald's is closed. I don't have enough money. We got issues. And so what does Andrew do? Brings a little boy with some fish and some loaves, to what? To Jesus. He's always he's bringing people to Jesus all the time. John chapter 12, there's some Greeks, pagans, goyim, dirty Gentile dogs. And they come to Philip and say, oh, we've heard about this Jesus, this Christ, and he's awesome, and we want to meet him. And Philip doesn't know what to do. And it doesn't say why. Does he not know the protocol? Does he not know how to introduce somebody to Jesus? Does he, is he insecure in his relationship with Jesus? Is he, it's getting close to the time when Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to die, and Jesus has been talking about that, and I don't know if it's a good idea to do this right now. What's Andrew do? Andrew does what Andrew always does. Andrew knows that if someone wants to meet Jesus, Jesus wants to meet them. And so Andrew takes these Greeks to Jesus. Andrew was the first home missionary. He led Peter to Jesus. He was the first foreign missionary. He led these Greeks, these foreigners, to Jesus. That's just who Andrew was. He's hardly ever mentioned in the pages of the scripture, and when he is, he's playing second fiddle. Peter's brother, Andrew. He's a nobody on his own. Doesn't matter. God uses Andrew. God uses a nobody to reach Another nobody, Peter, a fisherman, who ends up on the day of Pentecost sharing the gospel to 3,000 people. Andrew doesn't do that. Peter does. But all of Peter's disciples, all of Peter's followers, wouldn't be there had it not been for Andrew. Any of you know the name Edward Kimball? Nobody. He was a Sunday school teacher in Boston, and um, he was a short timid little guy, kind of soft hands, kind of timid, soft-spoken, a little bit of a mousy kind of guy, Barney Fife, but maybe not as erratic as Barney Fife. Little skinny guy, and he had in his Sunday school class really big, well-built, uncouth, unmannered, profane, dirty-talking, 16-year-old young man started coming to a Sunday school class. And in the power of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit began to nudge him. You need to go and talk to that young man. You need to go and talk to that young man. And he determined that he would do it. Now, in the power of the Spirit doesn't mean with confidence, with articulation, with power. That's not what that means. It means that when the Spirit gives us the little nudge, the little push that we obey, so he makes up his mind, oh, on Monday, I'm going to go to where this young man works. He worked in Holton Shoe Store in Boston. I'm going to go and confront him with the gospel. And so he works himself up, and, and he's nervous about it, and he's afraid, and he's shaking, and he makes up his mind. He's going to go and talk to this young man, and he's psyching himself into it, and he walks right by the door of Holton Shoe Store. 
And he looks back and he realizes he's a block away and he says later, I'm, I determined I'm going to go have it over with. And so he bolts down the street and runs into the shoe store and he looks around. The kid's not there. If it was me, if it was you, we go, Lord, I did what you asked. It's all good. But he doesn't do that because that's not what he was asked to do. So this timid little guy who's shaking and quaking in his boots walks like he owns the place back into the stock room. Well, the 16-year-old's not counterworthy. He's rough and profane and gruff. And, and so they've got him in the back wrapping shoes and stocking them according to size. And Kimball says that he cornered him in the corner of the stock room. And Kimball says, I gave the lamest gospel presentation ever. I don't even know what I said. Something about the love of Christ. That's all he remembered. He couldn't remember what he said to the 16-year-old. John Calvin in his institute says that it is better to limp along with the Word of God than to run with all haste apart from the Word of God. So Edward Kimball is limping along with the Word of God. He's there with his knees knocking. I can empathize with him. I'm an introvert. I don't like to do this. If you see me in the morning back there, I'm like this. I don't sleep on Saturday nights. I'm not kidding. But you do what you're called to do, so you do it. So here I am. And there was Edward Kimball with this guy pinned in the corner, and he's, he's blurting out something about the love of Christ. He doesn't even remember what he's told him. And then he leaves, and he goes, oh, phew. Now, unbeknownst to him in that corner of that stock room, that 16-year-old boy committed himself to Christ in that moment. And that 16-year-old boy's name was Dwight Moody. You've heard of D.L. Moody, great evangelist, second half of the 19th century in America and in England. He went to England, and some of his converts included C.T. Studd, a pioneer missionary, and F.B. Mayer, who was an evangelist in his own right. And so um, he went all around the world. D.L. Moody, and he preached the gospel. He was the Billy Graham of his age and of his era. And he started Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, training thousands of Sunday school teachers and pastors and missionaries and scholars for work in the kingdom of God. It's still there in Chicago. It's a big church, Moody Church. Um, very uh, impressive. Well, one of the guys that met Jesus as a result of Moody's ministry in England was F.B. Mayer. He's a South African, but he was in England. And he came to a crusade and he heard the preaching of the gospel and he responded to the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ. And he became an evangelist. And so he was in America and he was preaching. And a young man by the name of J. Willard Campbell came to a crusade that F.B. Mayer was preaching. And he met Christ, and he was excited about Jesus. And so he was going up and down the eastern seaboard, J. Willard Campbell, you never heard of him, preaching about Jesus in his own crusades. And his ministry was bursting at the seams. He, he realized, you know, I've got lots of converts and followers, but I need to disciple these guys. I've got to consolidate things and teach them, and I can't do that and keep preaching. And so he looked for somebody, a protege, a disciple, that he could give himself to so that he could consolidate the ministry. And a baseball player by the name of Billy Sunday had recently come to faith. And J. Willard Campbell discipled him. And we know Billy Sunday was a great evangelist at the turn of the century. And Billy Sunday came to North Carolina and preached a crusade down in Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, people in Charlotte thought it was awesome. Some businessmen, this was great, and they got excited about Jesus. And we need to do this every year. And Billy Sunday wasn't available to come back. So they started just getting different evangelists to come to Charlotte and preach the good news, to preach at these crusades that they would underwrite the cost of and bring these people in. And they brought in an evangelist by the name of Mordecai Ham from Louisville, Kentucky. And Mordecai Ham preached a crusade. And there was a young man sitting in the back of that crusade by the name of Billy Graham. And Billy Graham came to faith. And I don't need to tell you about Billy Graham. You know, just like Peter's disciples and Peter's followers were there because... Andrew, a nobody, was willing to bring his brother. Just like Edward Kimball, a nobody, was willing to go corner a 16-year-old stock boy in the corner of a stock room in a shoe store in Boston, God uses individuals. 
We read the statistics, Billy Graham Association and others, that yes, people come to faith as a result of big public crusades and rallies. People come to faith in those circumstances. But the vast majority of people come to faith because one person was excited enough about Jesus and cared enough about them that they were willing to come and say, here, come with me, come meet Jesus. That person in my life is named Steve Weber. I don't know who that person was in your life, but you know who it is. I mean, some of you may have come to faith watching a Billy Graham crusade on TV. I know people that that's been true for. But the vast majority of people have come to faith because their parent or their school teacher or, where's Carol? What was that list? She's not here. Um, she loved them enough and was excited enough about Jesus just to share that with them. This is the way that the gospel is communicated, that we individuals just share our love of Jesus with somebody else. And we don't know what God will do with that person. If they get a hold of that person, what God can and will. Just like only Jesus could see what Peter would become, only Jesus could see what Dwight Moody would become. Edward Kimball's been as a footnote in history. Nobody remembers his name anymore, but we all know D.L. Moody and we all know Billy Graham. And none of that would have happened if it hadn't been for in the power of the Spirit. He went with his knees knocking. It doesn't mean that that's not in the power of the Spirit. He was obedient to the leading, the pushing, the nudging of the Holy Spirit. We as the people of God at Trinity Christian Fellowship, we need to tune ourselves into the leading of the Holy Spirit, the nudgings, the pushings of the Holy Spirit. We don't know what God is going to do with us here in Pinehurst and beyond Pinehurst. I hope when you look at Jesus that you get excited about him and when you think about the people whom you know and you love and some who don't know Jesus, that you would be willing to bring them to Jesus like Andrew did, like Edward Kimball did. Lead others to the Lamb.